happy spring, everyone, and, and happy Women's History Month. I thought we'll just get in just, in, just under the wire so that we can observe that. Um, many, many years ago, I heard a story that I could not forget. And that was about a young woman in New London, Connecticut, very young woman, probably in her teens, um, who was, was put on trial for murder after her newborn uh, died on the night of its birth. Um, she was arrested in New London, actually by the sheriff of New London. She was put in jail for almost 20 months, and jail in those days were, was a horrendous place of solitary confinement. And finally, she was executed, Sarah Bramble, on November 21st, 1753. You can see why this story might have you know, mystified me and troubled me for so many years because it didn't seem to be in a lot of the history books. So, But I decided to create a fictionalized version of Sarah Bramble's story. And those of you who've read the book, you were able to meet Mercy Bramble. And we'll talk more about all the missing elements that really drove me toward fiction. But I'm not a historian. I am more of a storyteller. So I went the route that Nathaniel Hawthorne went when he wrote Scarlet Letter. You have to just speculate, make, you know, make decisions about the characters, and in the end, you can come up with your own, your own ending if it's fiction. So, I'm going to take five minutes and just read the first three pages of the book because I really enjoy doing that, and it gets me into the, the characters. So, imagine that we're not in this meeting room in Groton, but we're across the river on the, near the Thames River, um, also in a small jail, jail cell. The year, the date is November 20th, 1753, and we're in the colony of Connecticut. It's a British, uh, you know, British Connecticut, not the current state. The speaker is a girl named Mercy Bramble, and she's reciting a nursery rhyme to herself uh, in the dark. Mercy <coughs> Bramble is my name. England is my nation, New England is my dwelling place, and Christ is my salvation. The childish lines I used to recite were nonsense to me now, sorry about that, neither truth nor lie, yet they kept repeating in my head as though the words could tether me to this world for another day. I, Mercy Bramble, had looked ahead to a life of many days, not just one. But because of all of you, this was to be my last night on earth. You'd taken everything from me by then. You'd even taken my name, Bramble, and twisted it into something evil, a brambleweed that chokes other living things. Worst of all, you'd taken away my dream of ever knowing true freedom. Like a doomed ship striking rocks, a northeast gale slammed the prison walls over and over. The wind had crossed many miles of cold Atlantic waters to reach New England's shore. I used to love the wind when I was a small girl. Now it was hard to believe that there was once such a person, that timid little Mercy who lived as a servant at the Holtz farmhouse and kept and uh, slept in their attic. Hearing the wind rage from abo above her always made that little girl feel so safe from harm. Now, as I crouched in the dark without a single candle, I didn't know whether to weep like a child or suffer in silence like a martyr of the scriptures. What was the use in pretending that I was safe anymore? After living as a prisoner for so many months, I'd almost forgotten my former life as a servant. My never-ending duties from those days seemed pointless to me now, how I kept the hearth fire going from dawn to dusk, even in the blazing heat of summer. It was silly to think of it, but Faith, the sheriff's short, plump wife, had become a servant to me, the actual prisoner. Occasionally, she washed my clothes, my, uh, my garments, and loaned me baggy things of her own to wear while my ragged gown and shift were dried on bushes by the lane. Never had I felt so naked knowing that all of you, especially you men, could see my clothing spread out on display. 
I suspected that my youth and appearance gave faith more cause to despise me than the crime with which I'd been committed, or the sin I'd committed before that. It's colder than the devil's heart in here, she'd complained to me early in the evening. Her tone was reproachful, as if I were a miserly innkeeper who kept my hearth cold and allowed my guests to shiver. When she'd said the same thing to me before, I'd always turned away, rolling my eyes. I wondered why older people always like to repeat themselves. Did they think that we younger ones really weren't listening? In months past, I would have answered her with a touch of impudence. So just let me out of here, you silly old woman. You, you wouldn't have to wait on me anymore or mind this hearth. Or better yet, why don't you open a window? so I don't have to smell your stench anymore. There were no windows in the cell, of course, and I couldn't have summoned any strength to crawl through one anymore. My life had been short, but I learned one lesson well, that people were not always as they seemed to be and could change from day to night. That proved true again when Faith returned much later than usual one evening, carrying an armload of kindling to light my fire, and as always, a bowl of boiled potatoes. My husband's fast asleep already. Even a sheriff has to close his eyes sometime, but who knows what a prisoner could do when no one was looking. She lifted her apron and showed me a set of keys tucked into her bulging waistband. And look, the door, it's wide open. How careless of me. She laughed like a young, nervous girl, her, her eyes darting away. Yet I hadn't been able to walk through the door that night, suspecting that her offer had only been a kind of trick. Once I'd been such a strong young woman, but I'd been fasting for days now. My strength was gone from both my body and my mind. All earthly matters were fading, slipping away inch by inch like a dry snakeskin. Hope was growing thin and slipping away as well. I saw no way that I could escape into the darkness of the woodlands. The pathways leading from New London and across rivers to the east and the west were for others to travel, not for Mercy Bramble. All of you had determined my route and chosen my destiny. I would begin my journey the next morning, but I still had one long night ahead of me to reflect and to remember. And so I did. From that point, the novel goes back, and we meet her as a as a little girl when she was uh, first a servant. So, so again, who was Sarah Bramble, and why should we care about her? Well, first of all, she was uh, had several strikes against her. She was probably illegitimate herself, uh, due to the fact that she was given away at such a young age to a master. Um, she was definitely illiterate. She could not read or write. She was unbaptized, which made her an outsider in a society that was very focused on the church. And um, she was also an indentured servant. Now I find a lot of us have either forgotten what indentured, indentured servants mean or think that it might have been some type of punishment or uh, training program. But um, in the end, again, there were hundreds of indentured servants where you signed a contract with someone for seven years that you would serve them and completely do their bidding in return for room and board and, and some you know, instruction. So there are many certificates of indenture that you can look at even online because the artifacts remain. But I want to read one that I put together. I've shortened it a little bit. Uh, your master and mistress ye shall faithfully serve for seven years. Their secrets ye shall keep close. At cards or dice ye shall not play. Fornication ye shall not commit. Matrimony ye shall not contract. Taverns, alehouses, or places of gambling ye shall not haunt. As your master, I agree to provide lodging, education, meat and drink, uh, and education in the scriptures. And then after serving seven years, I will provide two good suits of clothes, one for Sunday and one, and one other for work. And then at that point, you would sign or your parent would sign if they're trying to get rid of you. That would be the minimum age. Uh, and then they would write in handwriting the same contract in two different places. 
And to make it, just to make sure no one forged something later, they would take it and tear it into a pattern like this, a very unique pattern, usually in this zigzag format. And then you took half and I took half so that no one would, you know, try and fool anyone else. And then seven years later, you had to make sure that it was exactly the same document and the same fit. So that's how it was done before we had photocopiers and digital scans. So I just thought that was interesting. And that's how the name indentured came from, because it was indented uh, from the front on dawn into and they became indentured servants. And it was a term that was left over from the Middle Ages. So anyways, I'm going to jump right into our, our slideshow here and take you on a little tour of Gallows Road and how I, how I came up with this book. OK. How many of you are familiar with the actual road? Only one or two. OK. Yeah, it's about half and half. So it runs through. Um, I don't want to get too far from the microphone. It runs from Connecticut College uh, through to Bloomingdale Road in an area that's now Waterford, but before Waterford was incorporated, it is New London. So it's mainly wooded, and the reason it's preserved that way is because it's part of Connecticut College Arboretum now. But um, I thought this was interesting. When I looked at a Google map, it shows me a road that really isn't there, that's only a path. So I thought that was curious. This intersection or the cross crossroad where Sarah Bramble was probably executed. Some of the accounts say she was executed at the highest point in the road, in the road, not off the road. Again, they were brought there by horses and wagons. They're not going to bushwhack, you know, although parts of this were probably uh, farmland. The idea is that no one wanted someone executed on their own property. There's old British laws and superstition that you would, you know, bring bad luck. No one wanted it in their backyard. So people had to go outside the, the area to do that. And there were a lot of superstitions associated with those crossroads. So, you know, you might meet the devil at that crossroad. So, um, Anyway, this is the way it looks today. You can still walk there through the Arboretum. I'll show you uh, what, the pat what the gate looks like. But she was taken by a uh, horse-drawn cart over this road to, to set up in, in the gallows. I recently learned that there were 36 armed soldiers on either side of the wagon, but it was still a near riot scene. There were thousands of people who had gathered there to watch the, the execution. Um, and that's me out walking, but also that is the gate. There's no parking there, but it's still you know, a good place to go for a walk if you're interested in the, the history of that area. It's not a main part of the Arboretum, but it is part of the uh, protected areas. So Now, I'm just going to look at some of these other landmarks in town that inspired me. And of course, the Joshua Hempstead House, which dates to 1678. Um, Joshua Hempstead appears as a character several times in the book because he really was involved with the historical, uh, the historical character. He was there when she was arrested after the death of her baby, and he was definitely there at the execution, as I'll show you in his diary. So, and it has fireplace cooking there too, so I've had some sense of what the kitchens look like. Waterford Beach I included because I grew up in Waterford and almost grew up on that beach as well. But there are scenes in the book uh, where the two servants go out to the beach, and this is where I imagine them, them being. They were actually kind of deserted places at that time. No one went and sat on the beach like we do. And they were considered kind of useless because the, you couldn't graze cattle there and you couldn't plant crops. And it was very dangerous for ships in that area. And there were, you know, several major shipwrecks off, off of what is now Waterford and, and Niantic. So, again, that inspired me. That was just taken in January. It's just always a beautiful beach. This map is from, oh, about 1758. And it was published in London, not New London. And again, just a reminder of how kind of desolate <laughs> the, the, the areas were at that time. Many of the towns that we 
uh, know now, like Ledyard, were not named or on those maps. But you can see the major highway, which was Boston Post Road and also um, the road to Norwich. I thought it was interesting that the Thames River was labeled the New Thames River. So there's been a lot of discussion of that lately. So, and okay, let's see. Whoops, I jumped over one of these. This is a, a place I'd spent quite a bit of time in New London. It's near the Magnet School off of, uh, between, I'd say near the Magnet School and the Greek church. It's called the Antientis burial ground, which was sort of a corruption of the ancientist. And everyone was buried there in layers and layers and layers. So originally I thought that Sarah Bramble was buried there. And I, you know, spent time there thinking, you know, who else was buried there that might have affected her life in some way. I later found that her child was buried there, the deceased infant, in what is called a pauper's grave. So all around the edges are just many, many are not marked. And um, other people too have been buried without uh, gravestones because they were very expensive to have and sometimes a family would save up and 50 years later buy a tombstone. So that's me wandering around because I'm looking at the names and checking the dates and trying to come up with background for the book. So this doesn't show up very well but it happens to be the, fa the Christopher's family. And in the book, um, I used the historic character who was the sheriff. His name was Christopher Christophers. And of course, there were several men in that family with that same unusual name. But he himself did not have a, uh, a, a tombstone, the one who um, actually executed Sarah, Sarah, the real Sarah Bramble. So. And I had to include Benedict Arnold, because even though he's far past the time period of my novel, he is in a way responsible for having burned New London and probably burned many diaries and journals that could have <laughs> been helpful to us uh, years later. So uh, he didn't, of course, that burning was in 1781. And he was said to have stood on his horse in that burial ground uh, that I just showed you and watched New London burn. So he's uh, always a figure that haunts us and that no one I can, can never forget. It's possible that as a Norwich native, he could have actually attended her hanging. One of the reasons uh, for all these, uh, I guess the, the different events around the hanging usually included sermons. And you know, it's horrible for us to think of it, but children were brought to these events because they were supposed to be instructive. You know, as whatever you do, don't, don't go down this road. So it's, it's not inconceivable because he was 12 years old about at the time. And as I'll see, people from 20 and 30 miles around came for that, for that hanging. Another character in the book who is a real person is Timothy Green, a printer who lived in New, New London, who was part of a dynasty of printers, the whole family, there are almost 20 of them at least four of them called Timothy Green. But um, this little plaque is in the sidewalk that marks uh, the, the oldest, uh, hit the site of his print shop and the, you know, one of the colony's earliest newspapers. But New London didn't have a newspaper until about 1756. So again, at the time of the events that inspired me for Gallows Road, there was no newspaper but there were broadsides printed, lots of sermons, and what we call gallows literature that was printed and handed out at the uh, events. So let's see, come on, whoops. This is the house, it always has a for sale sign on it, but um, it's possible, I'm sorry about that. And that, that is right in State Street, and definitely the oldest one in New London, so. This, incredibly, is Timothy Green's original printing press, which still survives today. And it's in, it ended up in the Vermont Historical Society in Montpelier, because Vermont did not have a printing press. And in order to qualify as a state and to print your charter and your rules and your laws, you had to have a printing press. So Timothy Green later sold this press, had it dragged by two oxen all the way to, to Vermont. So, and he, was definitely the one who printed these, uh, the sermons about Sarah Bramble and, you know, her unfortunate uh, situation. So, 
I do find that kind of fascinating that he, you know, it was a very significant press because it was, if not the first, probably the second in the new world. So, and let's see. This is not as influential in the book, but a lot of us don't go, go, go down to see this, but the Old Town Mill, which John Winthrop built, of course, is still standing, and um, it's tucked under the Gold Star Bridge. Very hard to get to, but it is open occasionally. And the characters in my book bring the corn to be ground at this mill, and it would have been that mill. Uh, John Winthrop also made sure that no one else was allowed to have a mill. He made, he passed a law, so there was no rival, you know, McDonald's mill or something across the street. He had a monopoly, so. And again, I had to shape, shoot it through a chain link fence because that day there were police barriers or something set up, but I really wanted to visit all these places. Now, this place is very unusual. It's actually my home, the one I grew up in for 20 years, so in Waterford. And the reason I include it um, is just really, as any writer, you're influenced by your own life. So I found that in writing Gallows Road, I was probably influenced by growing up in a very old house. It was a little drafty, wasn't very well insulated. You know, the rafters still had bark on them for when they were cut with, with axes and so forth. And um, that well, which is no longer there, again, this house has been remodeled and sold many times and no longer looks like this, but that well occasionally did run dry once or twice in a drought. So that's why I was interested that there had also been droughts in that same colonial period. And I imagine what it would be like when your well runs dry. It's, it's miserable because you have to get, bring in water, so, but, um, so this also makes me feel very old. I think I took this picture when I was eight years old with my first camera. So but. this is the Connecticut State Library where I found all the, um, the documents about Sarah Bramble's court trial. And they've been very good to me. And either before COVID, I was able to go and actually handle these things. After that, you get them digitally uh, or emailed to you or sent as photocopies. So and I'll show, uh, shortly we'll show you some of the documents. And this one is part of, again, the case itself. When she came to trial, her case was called Rex versus v, uh, Sarah Bramble. Rex was George II, King George II. So it's a little uh, ironic that the King of England is, you know, uh, attacking really an illiterate servant girl in the in the colonies so and all these documents are handwritten of course this i've blown this up 50 times larger than the original so they're a little tough to read but they are um legible and let's see this goes into different details about accusing her of how that child died which they said she did the child died of neglect on the night of its birth unfortunately it was um Poor Sarah Bramble had to deliver her child alone. So we just don't know. We don't know. There's no way to know whether, you know, foul play took place or whether it was simply, you know, a very sad accident and, and difficult time for a, a teenage girl. So it, I don't have a pointer, but, um, you know, the, the child died of neglect on the first, the first night it was born, which, you know, is a little, a little hard to believe, but. And this is her death warrant, again, mentioning George II. Um, I was very pleased to find these documents. I didn't think that I could find them. And um, there they were. So our tax dollars at work. The archives are fantastic for the state of Connecticut. So. And this is signed by the judge, Thomas uh, Fitch, who has really no relation to Fitch High School. I looked into that, so but I'd probably come from New Haven. And um, again, it said this sentence is her to be hung between heaven and earth. So, um, and let's see, well, this document's even more significant to me because when I went through them, and again, it was post pre COVID, so I could actually handle them. When I saw this and held this in my hand, this is signed by the sheriff, Christopher Christopher's, uh, alleged, uh, swearing that he has 
just executed um, Sarah Bramble. So by the language is so strange, but you know, by virtue of and pursuant uh, to the within warrant this day, I cause the herein named Sarah Bramble to be taken to an open and convenient place for execution. And then uh, in New London, I cause said Bramble to be Sarah, Sarah to be hanged between the heaven and earth on the 21st day of November between the hours of noon and three in the afternoon until she was dead. So um, it was just very powerful for me. If you've ever experienced, you know, picking up something and actually being able to touch that history and imagine uh, what it was like and how, how this evolved. So, and let's see, whoops, skipping a little too fast, but we're getting there. So, and these are two books that I eventually purchased because they were the best for finding information about um, the actual event. One is the complete diary of Joshua Hempstead, again, who kept the diary for 40 years. And the other is written by a woman historian who first published it in 1850, which seems to me quite unusual. But we owe her a big debt of gratitude because she really had, you know, wonderful uh, powers of research and to, to keep a record. The other thing I did, not only just a few months ago, was go to the New London Historical Society and ask to see the original Joshua Hempstead diary. So for me, by that point, it was like seeing the Holy Grail and being allowed to, to photograph it. But um, let me just see, the actual entry is here, describing uh, how she was taken to a cross highway above Joseph Bowles. And um, th there were 10,000 people there of all sexes and all nations. Uh, and it was raining that day. And then that's just about it. That's all we get from, from Joshua Hempstead. I do notice this funny little doodle that he wrote. He must have known that it was a significant day because he drew this little finger, this little hand pointing and wrote in the margin, Sarah Bramble, um, so, so that he could, could find that again. So, but again, this is the sum total of what was in the other people's uh, and of course, it's all typeset in the Joshua Hempstead diary, so you don't have to read that script. But um, and this is this is Frances Manwary Calkins, who also wrote about it. She had a little bit more emotion about everything, and she called it. Uh, you know, she quotes Joshua Hempstead, and then said, uh, "Let's see, that it was a, a dismal and gloomy." place and she called the hanging a repulsive exhibition so she was the only one who seemed to pass a moral judgment on the on the actual event so and this I'm including just because I want to give credit to one of my high school English teachers you know you always have one who kind of really challenges you and he was the American history teacher and for some reason he loved Jonathan Edwards and talking about when we got to that part of the curriculum where we were talking about the Great Awakening, which was about 1741, a huge revival in New England where everyone really, you know, went back and uh, re-examined their religious roots. So, but he used to pace back and forth in the classroom. I won't give you, you know, a performance of that reciting sinners in the hands of an angry God. He said it was one of the most important sermons ever preached in the, in the United States. So I didn't realize that because that had just sort of haunted me, you know, in a way, thinking about that teacher giving that, that fire and brimstone sermon, you know, and if you weren't feeling guilty when he started, you'd probably feel guilty when he, about something by the time he was, he was done. But then I found the other day that, you know, look who printed this famous thing, it was Timothy Green. So another connection, you know, between the, Timothy Green was a, a very historic printer and, a, and that had also been preached in New London. But these feelings I think were probably still affected how people reacted to, to Sarah Bramble, that they may have used her as a scapegoat for, for other things. And 10 years before that, there had been book burnings in New London. And they were called bonfires of the vanities. And uh, Francis Calkins gives some great descriptions of those, of people throwing their frivolous things and onto, the, uh, onto the bonfire on the docks. Yeah, let's see. 
very quickly, just to give you some sense, and I highlight it. I know this isn't a vision test, and you really can't see Just to give you some idea of how many people were executed in Connecticut in those two centuries. So, you know, probably about 75 people altogether. And Sarah Bramble was the 40th. It was unusual. After a certain point, there were very few women who were executed. Uh, but the most, and I'm, you've probably been reading about it lately, are the witches, the so-called witches. And people are trying to exonerate the witches who were executed in, in Connecticut, which was, I can't remember, it was 10 or 20 years before Salem. So, but it was um, 10 women and, and one man who were, and again, the groups and families are now coming together trying to have them pardoned and to clear their record. You know, as it turns out, many of them were single women. Somebody wanted their land. Someone didn't want them to inherit something. And uh, apparently the children who were left behind were indentured, basically sold off as indentured servants. So um, this is, yes, yeah, Sarah Bramble. Some of the other characters in the book were inspired by a few of these uh, women, um, including Catherine Garrett and uh, a few others. So, But Sarah Bramble was the second to the last woman in Connecticut to be executed. So. Um, and I'm just including that to remind us that this is not ancient history. It was only eight years ago that Connecticut did, um, you know, ban the the death penalty. And obviously, there are states that still have those. But uh, to me, it makes it feel very contemporary that in 2015, uh, finally, the death penalty was was upended and overruled. And the men who were on death row at that time were all given other life sentences. So. It took a while, but it finally finally happened. So, and oh, okay. Else, another connection. Hartford Current was printed by Timothy Green's brother too. So they were they were really all over the place and just amazing. So, and this is just some of the printed stories that have come out about Gallows Road. So, it all comes back around. Now I'm in <laughs> a newspaper that Timothy Green's uh, orig originally printed. So it. It's just funny, and Connecticut Magazine did a wonderful story too, in which they really touched on uh, w what the real issues are about the book, so. Okay, and well, that's the end of the slide presentation, so I just really wanted to thank, it's been wonderful meeting with the book club here, and uh, the library generously bought many copies of the book too, so um, I've, it's just nice to be here in my almost hometown where I <laughs> wrote part of the book anyway. So, well, I'm going to conclude the program there. So thank you very much. All right. <laughs>